Okay, well, good morning, comrades, and welcome to Sunday morning at the Nebel Proctor Virtual Marxist Library. Um, this program is a project of the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library. And while you're getting settled, let me just take a few minutes to give you some background on our library and our institute. Uh, the library was named in memory of two remarkable individuals, Carl Niebel and Roscoe Proctor. Uh, Carl Niebel was a noted Marxist economist who fled Nazi Germany, came to the United States, served in the New Deal and the US Navy, survived the anti-communist McCarthy period, and became a professor at uh, San Jose State University in the early 1970s. And when he passed, he asked that his collection be donated and open to the public in memory of his honor, in honor of his uh, wife, uh, Elizabeth Hale uh, ne uh, uh, Nebel. So um, that's Carl Nebel. Roscoe Proctor was born in Texas and moved to California in the 1940s. He had a long career as a farm laborer, longshoreman with the IW, ILWU, and a community organizer here in Oakland. Uh, he was a member of the Communist Party's uh, political committee and also served as the secretary of the CP's uh, trade union department. Their collections of books and um, manuscripts were moved into our current home at 6501 Telegraph Avenue in Oakland, about a mile south of the Cal campus. And since that time, uh, the library served as a research center as well as a community center, providing affordable meeting space for commu diverse community groups. Our Institute for the Critical Study of Society uh, was formed about 20 years ago to further the library's goals of presenting our preserving our written heritage and supporting struggles for racial and gender equality and for socialism. ICSS members are active in different aspects of people's struggles in the Bay Area and globally. Some of us are affiliated with specific political parties and tendencies, others are not. We respect one another, but we do not necessarily agree on all issues. Accordingly, the opinions expressed in our lectures, workshops, and publications are those of the authors only and do not represent any kind of group consensus on the issues discussed. We are united, however, in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been for the past. And as a group, we continue to draw inspiration from the work of Karl Marx, including his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And I can think of nobody who better exemplifies this Marxian principle than our speaker today, uh, my friend and comrade, Gerald Smith. Uh, I met Gerald about 20 years ago, I think, when I returned to the Bay Area. Um, and he was also a member of the Peace and Freedom Party and other groups. And we uh, worked together with Peace and Freedom and um, with, with uh, the Oscar Grant Committee. And I have to say, I've learned a lot from Gerald, and I'm sure everyone will also. And um, so before I turn it over to Gerald, I'll pass it on to Raj. And I think Gerald will introduce some other comrades that he has uh, invited today. But I'll turn it over to Raj to run the program and I'll mute myself and butt out, as they say. Uh, okay, thanks, Gene. So, uh, Gerald, you have uh, uh, others who will speak with you, I take it. And you introduce them. I since uh, Gene has introduced you, no reason for me to go further other than to say you have about 50 minutes to do the presentation, following which we will go uh, for, a, uh, for a short break, meaning Gene will come on, make some announcements, 
and then we'll resume uh, with the, uh, comments and questions and comment and your responses to them. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Gerald, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Raj. I want to thank Raj and Jean and for keeping this forum series alive. A task that may seem simple, but nothing is simple during this period, as I will explain. First of all, I, I have to tell you that my candidates have elected to not show up, and I want to explain why. We, this pandemic is a little bit more than I expected. My personal stubbornness and, and my subjective desire to, to go forward no matter what apparently is not shared by the entire American population. Given the leadership that we suffer from in this country, people are very much confused and afraid. And as a result, we have had to have debates inside our movement as to whether or not it is appropriate to knock on people's doors during this pandemic. I want you to know that I have done that. So even at Literature Drops, I knock on selected doors. For instance, we recruited a block captain because we noticed that the woman had a Bernie sign still in her lawn. Should we just lock, drop the literature and leave? No, no, I knocked on the door. And as a result of that conversation, we recruited a new block captain. And so it goes. But um, Ben wound up, even though he agreed to be here, he had six volunteers that were prepared to go with him today to knock on doors in his district, which is District 7. Well, what do you want him to do? Six volunteers, he decided to go and work with his volunteers. Uh, Mike, Hutchison, or well, first of all, let me just explain to you who our candidates are. I am a member of a group calling itself Oakland School Board Elections Action 2020. Now we are a group of citizens, teachers, parents, and uh, we basically support Oakland Public Schools. It may sound simplistic, but in today's environment, it's actually a struggle. Uh, we want school, a school district that makes high quality education, excellent teachers, and a supportive and healthy student social experience, the top priorities for all of our students. We, once again, that may seem, well, what is he talking about? Of course, everybody's for that you will soon find out that everybody is not for that. We want programs and electives to offer the students and parents the choices they want and need in their neighborhood community schools. Once again, people say, well, what's wrong with that? Of course, obviously, it is not obvious. For instance, some of, uh, uh, McClimate, right? Mac, which is 82% black, only has six electives. Six, six electives. That is to say that those students basically don't have a choice to excel. They have to take what's required. They graduate, they get, and, and let me, let me share this with y'all. It's hard to believe this, but 90% of their graduating class went to college. How many of you could possibly be aware of that? This is a school that the Oakland Unified School District superintendent wants to shut down. It appears to me they're being quite successful if 90% of their students who graduate go on to college. What is going on here? 
how do we explain this? Well, we want every student to achieve a high school diploma that has academic value and has provided practical life skills and cultural enrichment. So who would be opposed to this? There is a movement afoot in this country for the privatization of all public facilities. And we need to learn how to face this and what the consequences are. For instance, we know they wanna, they wanna do away with the post office. The post office. They wanna privatize our schools. Here in Oakland, those of us who support the Longshore Union are finding ourselves in a situation where we are fighting against these privatizers, in this case, Mr. Fisher, the owner of the A's baseball team, who is a billionaire, wants to create a new stadium. Now, let's understand this process of privatization. What does the ruling class do, or the section of the ruling class that wants to privatize all public facilities? As the leader of the post office recently said on television, before they can get the working class populations to abandon their own public facilities, they, they befoul the atmosphere. They intentionally sabotage those public institutions to make them appear less and less viable. We are fortunate that the workers who are postal workers came forward and protested this publicly. And thus, the attempt of the, well, the Trump regime to literally liquidate the postal department during an election was stopped to a certain extent. The, the, the damage is still to be, you know, surveyed. We don't know what's going to happen here. Well, that's the same thing that's happening, for instance, in education. In order to first get people to see, the number one problem we have with education is racism. We have to know that. Only 10% of the students that attend Oakland Unified School District are white. 10%. 10% of the children in this society in Oakland, you know, whites are more than 10%. But there have been decisions that people make. And I want to say, I totally understand those decisions. Their children come first. They try to make sure their children get a decent education. And thus, we get people that go out of district, private school, et cetera, et cetera. For many, many decades, the ruling class tried to impose the voucher system on Oakland, and we rejected it time and time again through propositions and other means. Unfortunately, if you recall, the Supreme Court decided that money equals freedom of speech. And this may seem simple, and maybe some of you actually agree, but the consequence of this was to do away with any restrictions for election campaigns. What this translated to in Oakland is the following. Rich or organizations and people, for instance, I will be talking about go public schools, all right? But first, let me drop back and talk about who I am just very briefly, okay? Gene already pointed out that um, I am one of the co-founders of the Oscar Grant Committee. And if you want more information, I'm going to stay after 
this forum, and I'd be more than willing to discuss it with you. But we have to talk about the problems at hand here. I'm also a member of the Labor Action Committee to Free Mumia. And by the way, isn't, isn't life strange? In 1999, we organized amongst the teachers to devote an entire day of instruction to Mumia Abul Jamal and the death penalty. And we won through the union this day. Actually, a significant act, a very significant act. And it just shows you the potential here in Oakland. Enormous potential, but you have to follow through. You have to follow through. And this is, once again, this need for a revolutionary party. I cannot, I just can't explain. It's, it's so necessary to pull these ends together. Okay, so the, the Labor Action Committee has formed something called, all right, we recruited some um, prison abolitionist youth. And naturally youth want to get out there and do stuff. So we wound up building a movement with them called No Justice Under Capitalism. This is the t-shirt right here. Our slogan is no state execution by COVID-19. And just very briefly, but I do want you to know, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm in such, I mean, just, I don't have a spare moment to breathe almost, and that's not good. Once again, the need for a party. We, we went May 9th to San Quentin, and at that point, um, there were six people in San Quentin that had the coronavirus. We went again June the 20th, but what happened in between? The incompetence, one of the things that this pandemic does is it displays the incompetence of the so-called leadership we, you know, that we have right now. The incompetence of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation is so gross that it's staggering. There was an outbreak of the coronavirus at Chino Penitentiary. What they then did was move pay, moved people from Chino to other, to other institutions thinking that this would relieve the the outbreak at Chino. The results, there are now over 2,000 cases of the coronavirus at San Quentin, where they sent people to this facility without testing them. Come on, guys. But So this is what we're facing. I can tell you that uh, the, the next demonstration that we had at San Quentin there were 125 cars, and then we did one August the 2nd, and at that one, the largest one, there was over 1,000 people. We tried to socially distance 300 cars. The reason I know the car number is because that was my job, to count the cars and the people. So I can tell you those are accurate figures. So that, but here, this is the leadership, and Gavin Newsom, is responsible because he calls the shots. We demand that, this, that they follow the science. The scientists say that the institutions can only hold 50% of what they have now and allow for social distancing. We have managed through this coalition to get 8,000 people released from prison. This is important because over 30 have died. And just San Quentin alone, this sitting ducks, what can we do? This is my life. This is what's going on. But the school board election, I think, is more important. Now, I would like to 
convince you why and secure your support if, if at all possible. I think most people can agree that public schools are indeed the cornerstone of our society. That taxpayer dollars must go only for our public schools that are democratically governed by the community that they serve. Here is where the billionaires come in. They literally bought the school board. Now, how do I know this? Is this some crazy conspiracy? And blah, blah? No, no. There was a strike of the Oakland Education Association. And during this strike, I am also a member of the DSA, okay? A social democratic organization that functions, largely a youth organization that functions nationally. They claim to have a membership of 70,000 people. So I'm in that group. And in that group, it was through the, you know, they're terrible on the organizational question, discipline, other things. They're just terrible. They support the Democratic Party, et cetera, et cetera. But they do some decent research. And through their research, that's how we found out precisely how much the billionaires had donated to the existing school board, which is on its way out. When we published that information, we made signs that I persuaded the DSA to make signs with the picture of the school director and below it, how much they had taken from these billionaires. When the workers saw those signs during the strike on the picket line at demonstrations and rallies, they immediately got it. They understood you don't have to have more degrees than a thermometer to understand if these people are taking money from folks that want to privatize our public schools, that is precisely what they're going to do. And they have shut down 35 schools in the city of Oakland. Another one third of our schools are currently charter schools. Now, we think that the charter schools are negative for the following reason. We do not oppose people having choices, not at all. But the problem with the charter schools is they exist as parasites on the public schools. They take resources from the public schools. This is not good because the public schools are already underfunded. So you take a bad situation and you make it worse. So let me just give you one example. Here in the, in the seventh district, that's Far East Oakland, we have a guy named James Harris who is the school board director, okay? Dude took, you have to restrain yourself when you talk about these things. $150,000 from these billionaires. And you know what he's been doing. They've been voting to shut down the schools and sell the property. Well, we, we thought otherwise. And we fought at every school board meeting. We fought at every possibility that we could to prevent these people from shutting down our schools. We created a movement. And this movement also included, for instance, and we've had some victories along the way, I must say, this movement included the Black Organizing Project's victory to stop the police. We basically eliminated the police from the Oakland Unified School District. This is a small victory on our way to much larger victories. The bourgeoisie has taken note of this. And it's sometimes we have to overcome a certain degree of depression. To, uh, but I have to report to you and please help by sharing this information with your base, with your organizations, that Bloomberg just gave $500,000 to Go Public Schools, which was originally formed by Bill Gates, who thinks he knows better 
than the communities that that actually you know utilize the schools how schooling should be so that's go public schools is pro charter and pro privatization of our schools but they say go public schools what does that mean to them they are in fact an organization of our most bitter enemies also he gave 300,000 to the charter school foundations well i have to ask you why why so much money why it's because of this movement that we have generated. I wish I could have prepared videos so you could see how Oakland is not for sale, another movement I'm a part of. Shut down the school board meetings. That's right, we shut them down before the pandemic. Shut them down with the support of the community. This is not just one small group doing this people felt that they did not represent the interests of the working class and joined in with the whole room chanting, no school closures, Oakland is not for sale. Given the, the fact that this took on a mass character, that's why these billionaires, $500,000 go to your organizations, tell them that the school board action 2020, which who I represent here now, is urging all people that can vote in district one, three, five, and seven to vote for, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna repeat this more than once throughout this presentation, one, District one, Stacy Thomas. I'll get into the specifics about what is wrong with Mr. Sam Davis later. District three, we have two candidates. Either one is fine with us because they are not taking corporate money. And that is Sharice Gash. That's district three. Or the CTA, the California Teachers Association, is supporting Van Cedric Williams. District 5, once again, Mike Hutchinson. And District 7, Ben Tapscott. All of these candidates have agreed to not take any contribution from a corporation, which I think is good. And, and by the way, the OEA put that forward months and months ago, and we agree with that. Okay, I think there's another thing wrong with these charter schools, and that's the following. A public school hires public employees who enjoy public service protection, employment stability, and their own elected leaders of their independent unions that represent them. We support that. We support the teachers' unions, the teachers' right to organize. And it never became clearer than when you saw what they were doing to Oakland. The average year of uh, service in the city of Oakland is like four years. People come into this district to teach, they see what a mess it is. Hopefully they learn. Many leave and don't become teachers anymore due to the, ex the negative experience, but some just leave our district. Well, the truth of the matter is I used to be a teacher, so I can tell you, you don't get into your stride of really learning your class management skills, how to develop your curriculum, knowing your community for about four years. It takes time for you to become a seasoned teacher. And when you lose people like that, what it demonstrates is they have destabilized our city. We need teachers that know their community. That, for instance, 
years ago, it was not uncommon that a, one teacher might have been the teacher for, for two or three siblings. This is a good thing. You know that Ms. Brown is there. She did a good job with your older brother. Now your younger brother's going. That's good. That's positive. That's stability. They have destabilized this city. That is why we need to win. I'm hoping we can sweep this election. This is a unique opportunity. Maybe never again will we have a situation where we can win four seats and walk in with the majority. I don't know what's going to happen, but that is the possibility and we have to go for it. Now, a public school, so one, charter schools, generally speaking, are anti-union. You cannot join the union if you're in most charter schools, the staff is not union, and therefore their staff will not be stabilized. A public school has the social responsibility to enroll all students and provide a pathway to success for every one of them. I used to work for Oakland Unified School District as a electrician, okay? So buildings and grounds. But as such, I went to all of the schools and I got a pretty good look at what was really going on in the schools. And one thing I noticed is that they had things like special education for children that were having educational difficulties. They had help for children that had severe disabilities. Not so in the charter schools. Charter schools are allowed, for whatever reason, to reject students that have these special needs. Yet another reason to oppose them. A public school should be part of making good on the promises of class and racial equity, economic justice, and be run in the context of social solidarity. The whole point of going to a public school is it's supposed to be an opportunity for all students. Why not every child? Well, what they have done in this city is absolutely cr criminal. So let me explain to you, please. This is not rhetoric. Unfortunately, I got this stuff coming out my ears, but I want you to know that Trammell, who is the school board supervisor, I, I hope you're ready for this, is a part of Betsy DeVos's organization that she inherited from Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush started a group called Administrators for Change. Yes, that's what they named it, okay? That's why you have to look a little deeper. This is administrators, public administrators, but not, not who favor charter schools, who favor the privatization of education. And the Oakland superintendent today is a part of of that organization. Can you believe it? I don't know. I, I, I Have you ever seen Bet, uh, this DeVos woman talk about education? It's embarrassing. But here, our superintendent is in league with her, with Trump. We have not been doing our homework, brothers and sisters because that is not a good sign, okay? Just one second, please. Let me just grab something, I'll be right with you. Okay, so a lot of people talk about racism, endlessly sometimes, rhetorically, but racism is real. And therefore it should be described, it should be, we should be able to understand it and how it is administered. In the city of Oakland, you may, you may think that, uh, well, I'm going to convince you. I'm going to make you all believers. 
in the fact that there is racism in this city, a city that was almost majority black at one point. In the last 15 years, here is the racist pattern of displacing our black students. One, we have decades of disinvestment, all right? So this starts from the fact that they do not give our schools enough money, period. And then you add to that the problem of the charter schools because the way a school gets money is per student, per diem. So every student that attends school, for every day they attend school, a certain amount of money is giving to, to that district, okay? The charter schools get a part of that money by the number of students. And let me tell you, I've been driving around this town, mainly you know, strategizing for our, our canvassing and all the work that we're doing to, to project our candidates. And it started to really sink in how many charter schools, you know, actually are in operation in the city of Oakland. It's dangerous, it's bad, but it is the reality. And we're going to, we may not be able to stop it in this one election, but we're gonna slow it down and we're gonna turn it around. And we have the candidates to do that. Now, that decades of disinvestment in black students, in black schools, in black communities, in West and East Oakland, leads to low enrollment. Do you think that black people want to suffer? I'm, I'm gonna make an admission here. Here's what I did. When I saw this process going on, I said, well, not my kids. I illegally, yes, illegally, sent my children to Berkeley, and to Albany. My daughter went to Albany. She graduated from UC Berkeley in 1982. My son went to Berkeley. Little Gerald went to Berkeley. That's how I dealt with it. But that is an individual resistance. That is not a mass resistance. It is not a lead resistance that we need. Why not every child? So the, the low enrollment, then, the administrators take that and say, well, nobody wants to go to the school. Guess what? Uh, this school is slacking. It is a failing school. And, and uh, they give those tests. That here's how they use the test. They say these tests prove that this is a failing school, and therefore there's no sense in keeping a failing school going. People are pulling their children out of the school that has low enrollment, shut it down. And that's what they do. So this leads to closing neighborhood schools. 16 out of 18 schools closed over the past 15 years served approximately 60% of the black students. What is it? So when you're a part of a failing situation, what psychological effect does that have on our children and our community? You're part of a failing school. You're a failure. Yes, that's what they're saying to our children. And in fact, you know, I got situations now where the same child, the same group of students have been, their school has been shut down three times in two years. Nobody wants me. This is intolerable. And we, there's something we can do about it. There is something we can do about it. And I'm hoping that we do, that I can move you to at least take, exercise your prerogative of voting to vote for the four candidates or the, you know, the candidates that I have just outlined. So, Closing neighborhood schools is not a plan. It's not a plan for improving the schools. It is an attack on our schools and our communities. Merging schools is not a plan. They make the schools such 
that people don't want to attend them. And then they say, oh, look, nobody wants to go. But remember, it is the school district, the OUSD district, that determines who goes to what school. For instance, they try to dissuade people from going to McClimate. When I found out that 90% of the students of McClimate were going to college, I was flabbergasted. How is that possible? That 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 high a percentage is succeeding. They don't they have no interest in trying to make sure that people know about this. This is a community effort to keep that school open and the community has stepped up and come forward and helped those kids and that's all they needed was some help. 90%, I wish 90% of the black students that graduate all, all went to college. I could only wish that. Now, okay, I want to now, so please, if you, by the way, if you know a journalist or if you put out a newspaper, you can do that research on Bloomberg's recent contribution. Please help us because we need help. And I'm not ashamed to say that. And we need help if you, if any of you want to donate your time and your labor, I, I hope to contact you or and right now to let you know that you can be a part of um, Ben Tapscott meets every Saturday at Castlemont High School, right there on MacArthur. That's where we meet. And from there, people are dispatched to different neighborhoods for lit drops, uh, installing signs and lawns. And we also, look, just to show you the hunger of the working masses, three weeks ago, I worked on Mike Hutchison's campaign, right? We set up a table in, uh, at the BART station in Fruitvale. That's District 5, okay? We had four people go out to do what we call a merchant walk. And what that is, they knock, they, they, they go to the stores and they ask, they say, look, we got some candidates that are fighting against school closures and we want your support. Will you help us? Every, all, we gave out 43 signs that were put up in these people's stores in two hours. The people want change. Here again, we need a revolutionary organization. And I can say that the DSA is not a revolutionary organization, but there are many militant youth in that group. There are many conscious youth that are working on this campaign and I, I'm thankful to work with them, but that does not change the nature of the organization as a whole. All right, so we definitely, what I'm seeing every day, we may not win. I have to say this, we're not guaranteed a victory, even though the masses are for us. Well, how? what's wrong with us then? There is a pandemic, brothers and sisters, we do have a problem. So we do have a problem contacting voters. If you want to help, I can connect you with the campaigns. I can connect you with the phone banks for the campaigns. And I am humbly requesting that you join us in this struggle. Um, I, I think we should, we should open it up for some discussion. And I plan to bring up more issues as we go. Would that be appropriate, Raj? You should unmute yourself, brother. I want to make an appeal here, right? So that's that's okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. It's okay. <clears throat> Before Raj. Yeah. 
Uh, before we go to discussion and more of this, uh, is this the best time to start with our uh, announcements of programs? Yes, this is a good time. Okay. Because, well, thank you very much, Gerald. I, I expected good and it was fully uh, 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 inspired by, by your comments. And um, yes, we, we, and as, as, as a, someone with students in, in, in Oakland, um, it's very much, my granddaughters live in Oakland, as, as do I. So this is very important. Uh, but let me just say, we do have uh, you know, other important things coming up on our schedule. Um, coming up uh, next week is uh, our very own uh, Larry Shoup is going to be talking about uh, COVID-19 and a comparison between Cuba and the United States and the differences in the way they uh, deal with uh, healthcare uh, and have reacted to the pandemic. And uh, Larry has uh, taught history at a number of universities. He's had books and he's been very active in the solidarity with the Cuban Re revolution. Uh, following that, we still have a couple of um, openings on October 18th and the 25th. Um, and, and we're hoping we'll get uh, some further discussion of important local issues and what's going on in response to the uh, pa pandemic and the coming election. Um, November 1st is approaching the anniversary of the October Revolution and our comrade from Boston, Wadia Halabi, will speak on the fall of the Soviet Union and how that um, uh, implications of that for for today. And uh, then on November 8th, we have invited a speaker because we don't know what's going to be happening uh, on November 8th. Uh, um, and it probably will be. So this will be our first meeting after that. And we're hoping to get Gloria LaRiva or someone else uh, from uh, her as her representative to speak on that. So we have a, a number of things coming up. And uh, subscribe to our email list and you will um, receive notices of that. And um, as we are a grassroots organization, we do rely on um, people who come to support us. We have our needs are minimal, but they are real. And I'm not even supposed to say that they're minimal. So I'm supposed to turn this over to someone who can uh, speak more persuasively on um, on our, 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 on our funding. And that would be Richard Fallenbaum. Are you with us, Richard? Uh, can you unmute Richard, please, Alan? Yes. Oh, yes. This is Richard. I'm, I'm the treasurer of the um, Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. And I'm um, just a little um, uh, Fun pitch. Uh, um, I looked. I look at the, occasionally at the cont contributors, and many of you have contributed. By no means all, but I would. Um, um, but I, I notice even for myself, it's uh, quite a while since I last contributed, and I'm going to contribute again today, um, because you know we, we used to do uh, a weekly contribution at the library, a small contribution. And um, it's easy to forget if we were doing it um, on Zoom. So, so I would urge people, even those people who have contributed before, uh, uh, I don't need to remind them that it may have been a while ago that they contributed before. Um, the, as Jean says, the library needs money um, to keep going, especially at this time. And we're an important source of support for that, and for for the ICSS also. So please give. Um, the best way for me for you to give is through PayPal. You'll see it uh, shown below in the chat section or in your invitation, your email invitation, the details of how to do it. But you can also contribute through a check or cash or um, those ways of doing it. So um, please be contribute and contribute generously. Thank you. Back to you, Jean. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, 
I, I'm trying to put that in, into the chat room. Did you do that, um, Richard? The info on that? No, he has not done it. So okay. Gene, I, go ahead. I, one of us will, but I'll turn it back over to Raj and uh, um, y y y you're in charge, Raj. Okay, thank you. So we now go to questions and comments section. And the way we'll proceed is uh, people can raise their hands uh, by, uh, and I already see one hand. So you can raise hands and uh, if you need any help, you can send a text. Uh, you can send it in the chat to Alan. Uh, uh, he can assist you. Alan is, is doing technical uh, work in this session and critical technical work. Uh, I think if everybody had two minutes, we can have two rounds. And I think in, on a topic as live as what Gerald has presented to us, it's a, that's a real local issue, a real uh, important issue. Oakland has now become a national thing. Even Trump has brought Oakland into it. Right. it reactionary. And that shows Oakland's potential as, as the center of our, uh, of our movement, uh, radical movement. And, and, and in, in that, uh, Gerald has, is playing a very, very important role right now and he needs help. So anyway, I'm going to go. There are two hands up. I'll keep an eye on who's raising hands. The first one is Sharon Rose. So Sharon, please go ahead. And, uh, uh, and Alan is unmuting you. And then you unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Um, it's nice to see you, Gerald. Um, I especially agree with what you said about how closing schools is not a plan for improving schools. Educators know how to improve schools. That's but right. They're not given a chance when schools are closed. And it's just a complete fallacious argument that says, well, if a school is, quote, failing or not doing well, that what we need to do is close it. What we need to do is put more resources, the right kind of resources, into it. But I wanted to um, add a few comments about the national context. So charter schools have, the movement for charter schools has been around for quite a long time. It didn't start with the Trump administration. In fact, Barack Obama had one person as his Secretary of Education for eight years. His name is Arne Duncan, Duncan that's and right. he's from Chicago. And he and he and Barack Obama think that charter schools are the silver bullet to what's wrong with with education in this country. And Duncan represents a growing movement to privatize, as you said. So um, why is Oakland, well, first of all, what, why are all of us so upset? Why are those of us who are upset about charters? Why are we so upset about charters? Why can't we all just get along? The GO candidates are putting out this line of what we need is a, just a portfolio of all schools. We're all one big happy family, right? Of course, if one part of a family is trying to kill the other part, then it's not a happy family. Ah. <laughs> so what's wrong with charter schools? Well, first of all, they're private schools despite the fact that they get public money. And a lot of them are not, uh, it, we should acknowledge that a lot of them are nonprofit. Some of them are for-profit, but in Oakland, the charters are nonprofits. But then how can you really talk about a, something being a, non, a nonprofit organization when its director makes like $200,000? You know, they, that, that person profits from that school. Um, they get private money as well as public money. They do not equally serve all students. So they cherry pick the students. I've talked to numerous parents who've told me, or grandparents who've told me that they, their kid was in a charter school and then along came the time to do the testing and all of a sudden it's like, your, your, oh, you know, your child is really not a good fit for our school, you should, what about, going down this uh, cross town to, to the local public school. They push certain students out. They push p kids who might have behavior problems out. They do not accept many, if uh, any, um, 
what we call special needs students, students who are disabled either um, in terms of learning ability or physically disabled because they need more resources. They take more resources to educate. Um, they, t they accept very few English learners because why? Well, teaching, teaching kids to uh, go to school in English when their native language is not English is difficult, which ends up pushing those students who take more resources into the public schools. Um, so there's been this movement against charters. And so why, why is Bloomberg spending $500,000 on this, this um, election? And it's not the first time. He, he, he spent $300,000 two years ago. Um, well, he's been convinced by other billionaires that this is the way to go in this country. And if Biden gets elected, nothing's going to change. Well, something will change. DeVos has some policies that are so horrendous that um, the, a Biden administration would get rid of them. But not, nothing will change about the overall targeting of communities for charters. A good example, an example that we all point to is New Orleans. There are no public schools in New <laughs> Orleans, except, except for a couple that serve very, very, very uh, severely disabled kids. But in, in you, one could, we can say with accuracy, there are no public schools in New Orleans. They took the opportunity after Katina to just do away with them. And there are other, other states and other cities that are being targeted, but Oakland is the main target in California. So if you want to fight the whole charter movement and the privatization movement, it, this is ground zero. And just one other thing, we succeeded last year in getting past some legislation that makes it a little bit harder for charters to be granted by school districts in 1505, it allows the school district to reject a charter school on the basis that it will impact the district fiscally. That was never the case before. So, okay. so we we are on, we have some. As Gerald said, we've had a few victories, but we certainly this is an ongoing struggle, and it's a national struggle. Thank you, Sharon. I think uh, it's appropriate. Excuse me, Ross. Could... Ross, can I? Can I? Yeah, just... yeah. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm okay. coming to you. I just wanted to say that Sharon took longer time, but it's appropriate because she teaches and is a teacher. So I, I thought that's important that she have the time. And now, Gerald, you uh, respond to it, and then after that, we'll go to Roger. He's the next one. Okay. okay. I, I okay. wanted to. I <laughs> I wanted to thank Sharon for her comments because, and this once again points to the need for a Revolutionary Workers Party because I believe that my listening to Sharon, I can see how inadequate my presentation was. Obama's the one. This didn't start under no damn Trump. This points to the Democratic Party. In fact, one of our candidates, uh, Mike, quit the Green Party because he wasn't getting enough money and went to the Democratic Party and guess what? He lost. They didn't support him because the Democratic Party itself it was the home of this charter school stuff. Well, it's where it started. I'm sorry. It's just, it's one has to overcome a feeling of desperation and, and depression to even talk about this. But thank you so much and 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 this is this is disaster capitalism we're dealing with now. They wait until the working class is disabled and on its back, and then they attack us, just as they did with Katrina. And lastly, uh, I just thank you, Sharon. I, I I have to make room for Roger, but I just want you to know, for instance, that there was a debate we were in yesterday with in the East Bay Times. And of course, all of the candidates in District 7 were part of this debate. 
And I noticed they did not want Ben to give solutions. When, you know, when these things came up, they said, well, what's the solution? Well, the GO candidate said, well, the solution, we have too many schools. Suggesting what? Shut down schools. They openly say it. It's, it's not a secret. And they're not embarrassed to propagate their reactionary program. I'm sorry, Roger, please. I'm, oh, okay, no, we'll go wait, on. Wait, after Roger will be Richard Fallenbaum. Just, so, Gerald, just, yeah, thank you for this presentation. It, it, it really tied the local and the national, the, the political. It tied everything together. A very important thing. I think for us who are working on the library, we, we have to do a much better job of outreach because I, I, I want other people to hear this. Um, fortunately, this is, is recorded so other people can hear it. Sharon's comments also, very, very important comments. Um, one, one quick question, one a little bit larger question. Um, uh, you mentioned actions at San Quentin, and it seems like I'm on every e email list but that one. So how would we find out about actions at San Quentin? I went up on there on, on September 13th for the Attica um, protest, um, memorial protest, and um, it turned out it was a bad air day, and it was just me and the, the organizer there. And so that was called off. But I, so I, if you could tell us about that or put it into the chat, where, where um, St. Quentin actions are taking place. On the thing about segregation, you know, Gerald, in the late 60s, I, I was down in Mississippi and, you know, peripherally involved in the civil rights movement. You know, people gave their lives to integrate schools. And then about three years ago, I went to a retirement party from a good friend of mine. She was retiring from the Oakland public school system. She had taught there all her life. And she talked about her students. And she said her students never had a white student in their class the entire time they were in that school. And that just, you know, I was just thinking, well, we'd won that battle. What, so if, if, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit about the, the, the re-segregation of, of America. Yes, I will. And I, I, want, I want to say this. This is a problem that is much bigger than any school board. We talk about this. Uh, ben uh, Tapscott is an integrationist. I am an, I am definitely an integrationist. I believe in integrated class struggle, to be honest. And I definitely think it's important that we have integration in our schools. But we have a special problem here in Oakland. Only 10% of our students are white. So let me go to a very specific situation. And hopefully, Roger, uh, let me answer your other question. That is, um, on the question of the San Quentin mobilizations, we are going to remain after the forum is over and Ross deems it, you know, to end the, end the, uh, the recording, I will stay and I will promise you that I will either get your email and send you personal information or send it to uh, uh, Gene and Gene can spread it throughout the Institute. But whatever you say, I'm going to do because we do want you to participate. Uh, I don't have it in front of me right now, brother. Okay, now let's look at the situation with Kaiser, okay? I already told you guys, I worked as an electrician for the district. So what does that mean? I had to go to each school. Eventually, I became the, um, <laughs> this is shameful. I became the, the person that did all security and fire alarm for, this, for the whole district. Over a hundred schools. It's just... But anyway, when I went to Kaiser, when I was working there, this was 2000, maybe 2005, 2004. The whole, it was, mo it was a white school, literally. It was a white school. So when I heard about the struggle of the Kaiser parents, I assumed without studying, 
that this was a, a white folks thing and you know what what the hell and that's what it was that's what it was tagged as by the administration that uses racialized resentment to keep us divided but upon closer consideration the 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 Kaiser parents started coming to the um the Oakland school board meetings and they formed a group called Oakland is not for sale and then when I started looking closely at them, I was shocked to find out that this school that was slated to be closed because of so-called low enrollment was one-third black, one-third white, and one-third Latino and Asian. A more integrated situation is not possible. How could you close this school and not only was it integrated and had parental uh, participation, which is key to the success of any school, the grades were up. So the only thing that the, that the school district administrators could point to was low enrollment. And I said, well, that's easy. All we got to do is just let people know what they got going on there. And there'll be plenty of people that want to come to a school that is succeeding and that is, you know, creating a community that is favorable to the development of its students. Brothers and sisters, they shut this school down. The only, one of the only truly integrated schools in Oakland this experiment, I didn't, I didn't even know about it until I started looking closely, was shut down by the administration under the false pretense that it was under-enrolled, which could have been, who is it that controls the enroll enrollment? It's the superintendent. It's Oakland Unified School District administration that controls which school people go to. So here's a school that's working in every con in every conceivable way, and they shut it down, y'all. So the struggle to integrate our schools is a little complicated, Brother Roger, because of the low percentage of white participation in the district. But even with that, we have this experiment that was working and has now been shut down. Please, Raj, may we have our next question. Raj, can you add Jane to the stack? Um, I don't see a place to do it myself. And unmute yourself, Raj. Uh, are you, you're unmuted now? Let me see. Yeah, you're unmuted, Jean. Yes, I'm unmuted, but I just said I'd like to get on the stack. You are, you are the next. Because you are, there's nobody else right now. Mary, Mary wants to be. Mary Sundove also well, wants to be. Put Merle on there, and then I'll be after her. Okay, so Mary, uh, uh, Merrill, please go ahead. Uh, uh, Merrill, uh, could you? Raj, I'm, I'm taking care of that. Okay, all right. Merrill, please, you go ahead first, and then Jean. After that, I will come. So there are three people in the staff. Merle, you have to unmute. Unmute, Merle. We want to hear you. Come on, sis. There you go. Oh, I got it. <laughs> okay, so I've been a teacher for, what, 40, 50 years. I'm 80, so it's a long time. Still am. And um, oh. what I realize is most people, especially in the white middle class, have no concept of what privatization means and does um, for schools. And it doesn't comprehend the, the concept of what's wrong, therefore, with charters. Or they, they have been bought, they have unconsciously bought that they have, uh, at, because there's been a long time under current uh, prop, prop, um, propaganda for a campaigning for pro public 
getting rid of public schools and corporate schools. So uh, I have taken, have put that information in, in, in media and everything. So it's just amazing to see what my friend, one of my friends who does not know, supports the Oakland school in the same way we would, but has no concept of what privatization of schools means or how that affects the corporate, the corp, the, uh, the uh, schools that are being supported that are not public within the school system. So I, it's just, to me, we got to do a similar kind of uh, work to educate people about this because it's not a broadly known thing. Thank you, right. Cheryl and, and uh, Sharon for your comments. Okay, so uh, we should wait for <laughs> Gerald or uh, he stepped out for a moment, I think. Looks like yeah, no, I, I, I just had to plug in my computer, brother. Okay, okay. I, I'm so back. response to that, and then we'll go to Gene. Yeah, my, well, my response is uh, I, I totally understand, Meryl, you know, and she is absolutely correct. You know, I don't, it's kind of strange here. I, I think I'm almost in uh, a friendly, you know, a friendly environment because I don't normally get this uh, in forums. You know, there's always usually elements who support the charter schools. We, it's been very tumultuous. And I want to uh, apologize for my emotional outbursts. But let me, let me give an example to show you how tied we are all to this problem. I have a, a grandson. His name is Justice. A very, very intelligent child. And he's bad. He just act up. You know, he, ooh, you, you want to hug him and kill him at the same time. Well, he he went, uh, my daughter, you know, because he went to Piedmont and the pr principal loved him and the teacher feared him because his grades were so high that he, he helped the, you know, the, the principal looked at it as a thing. Well, he keeps our grades up, but he's bad in the schoolyard, pushing girls down and fighting and, and just acting silly. So my daughter took him out of Piedmont because of his behavior, to be honest with you, and sent him to a, a charter school. Well, hell, he wasn't in the charter school uh, three weeks out. Now, this is a very intelligent child. If he took an intelligence test, it would he would score very, very high. He has problems as many children do and the fact that he is so intelligent doesn't seem to help him very much nobody wants to deal he now goes to martin luther king elementary school on market and 10th i think you guys may know of the school and i you know i try to support the school but this is one of those schools that is being underfunded and under resourced and it's just a small little tragedy and hopefully you understand why this is not an abstract matter to me. This affects my life, my children. I am a part of this working class that is being exploited and oppressed. And they do it to the educational sector also. So thank you so much, Merle. Okay, thank you. Uh Gerald, I just wanted to take uh, a couple of minutes of my time to say that actually uh, uh, the movement towards privatization of education is tied, seems to me, and then you please comment on it, with the Democratic Party, uh, which moved away from its working class base in the 1980s uh, with Bill Clinton founding that uh, leadership uh, group and through which he began to look for support of the capitalist class in a big way. And this is the time when uh, jobs were not yet transferred in a wholesale destruction of industrial America had not begun substantially, but there was crisis. So 
the Democratic Party basically followed uh, the logic of capital and uh, uh, began to uh, reduce taxation. And with the reduced taxation that has continued under both parties uh, for the rich people, they have basically defunded at national, state, and, and therefore indirectly at the local levels. Because the rich then move away, all those schools are funded by local taxes. They actually are based on community, but the rich people then move out and uh, live in enclaves. So the ghettoization of the communities takes place through this whole movement of capital. So today we have a sort of an oligarchic system and, and both parties, and that's why the Democratic Party under Obama continued the same thing because it's the logic. Now the only uh, class that can fight, overcome is, is the working class. So what is happening in Oakland is a heroic struggle, which we must support, but the problem goes way beyond Oakland and even Bay Area and California, it's, it's national. So, I would like uh, some of your thoughts uh, on this question of uh, linking local to national level. I mean, I, I have two kids and uh, they started out in public schools. And my daughter was extremely sensitive kid and Berkeley High was not doing well in high school. Uh, she had public education all the way through and the high school she she was responding to a lot of roughing up that was going on. So we had to move her out to private school. And our son was the same way. So after a while he had to be moved. But actually they did not, they had other problems. Private schools present other problems for children because children come there from well-to-do family and they have no sense about the society. So this is a sick situation for both sides. And, and, and this is what uh, capital has done in this oligarchic phase now, because they are not, uh, the capitalist class has detached itself now from American production and basically are making money outside. And they're saying the hell with you. Uh, we'll just keep going as it is, not make much money, but I make money internationally. So I don't see any, any solution other than the overthrow of the system. And, and Oakland is, is making a heroic fight like Cuba, essentially playing the role in this section in which you're involved. So please comment on, I've sort of laid out a very big kind of canvas for you to choose what you want to choose, but please connect as much as you can in your thoughts in it. Well, first of all, your critique of the Democratic Party is absolutely correct, including uh, locating this tactic uh, uh, Mr. Clinton introduced called triangulation. Can you imagine triangulation? When, when he first started talking about it, I said, well, my goodness, we have um, the Ku Klux Klan over here, then we have the liberals over here, so let's triangulate. And, and then split the difference and see, you know, what's gonna happen to black people. Are you nuts? The Democratic Party is the enemy of the working class, period. What we have to do is figure out how to navigate it. But in order to navigate it, we can't do what the DSA does, and that is to build illusions in the Democratic Party. I think, uh, no offense, but, you know, I think, uh, we can debate whether or not Bernie Sanders did some good by introducing the word socialism to American culture. I think he did, but I don't think it's enough. And it doesn't clarify the most important matter. And that is how do we get there? I'm afraid that my friend Ross, <laughs> Raj is right. There's no getting around it. Only a social revolution will, will provide the solution, open the door for all of the problems that the American working class is facing. But here, Raj, how? Who's going to lead? Where's our party? 
I just want you all to know that the Longshore Union has officially come out for a Labor Party. I, I'm going to support them. I'm thinking now that this is a step in the right direction. Such a Labor Party may fall short of the party that I would love to see come into existence that advocates and practices the policy and program of Comrade Lenin. But I think it is a step in the right direction. And I think we should be at least observant and hope for the best with this. Because when a union says they're gonna do it, if they can get other unions like SEIU 10 to 1 all tied to the Democrats, to break ties with the Democrats and launch a political party of and for the working class, I'll say it again, this would be a step in the right direction. Raj. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gerald. Uh, next one is Richard Fallenbaum, followed by Alan Miller. Oh, do we have a stack? I thought I was on the stack. Uh, Gene, uh, can you come afterwards since you have spoken once? May I? Uh, no, I, I haven't spoken once, I don't think. Not to the topic. Sorry, sorry. so you are next then. You are <laughs> actually behind me, I, I apologize. And then uh, Richard Fallenbaum and then Alan. Go ahead. Oh, okay, well, thank you. And I appreciate the discussion. Bye. And it's really great to have uh, uh, Gerald here to, uh, and everything he's saying. Um, but I want to say, you know, I grew up in Concord, which is over back when it was this little town east of the hills. And uh, I went through Concord Elementary, went to Mount Diablo High. When I got there, all the teachers already knew me. I was one of the rule boys that went to that school. <laughs> and so uh, that seemed natural enough to me. And when I graduated there, I, I came to Berkeley and paid my $45 for uh, per semester in fees and went through college, uh, got a fellowship to an otherwise respectable Ivy League institution, continued my education. And you know, I never realized that I was the product of one of the best educational systems in the world and it was all free. And I just assumed it would always be that way. You know, it, it's like, you know, it's always going to be like that. No problem. And, uh, you know, when Reagan was elected, I thought, well, okay, this is just a, a blip, and, you know, bottoming out, and then things are going to get better, but uh, shows how much I know about American politics. So, yeah, I think um, now we know how, how bad things can get, and with, uh, I'm convinced it can't get much worse than Trump, but we'll see. Um, but I did want to address this issue of, you know, like waiting for a or, the, the idea that uh, all we need is a, work, a new party. Um, and the kinds of comments that people make about dismissing those people who choose to work inside the Democratic Party, just saying, oh, all Democrats are the same. There's a large number of people who are very well read, very knowledgeable about Lenin, who think the best place for them to work is uh, inside the Democratic Party, I remember when I talked to Dorothy Healy, who was uh, uh, a former Southern California chair of the Communist Party and fought the, uh, during the McCarthy period. And I complained, oh, that's, uh, Democrats are a bunch of scumbags. I don't want to attach with, you know, I don't want to interact with them. And she said, well, honey, you're not there for the social contacts. You're there because that's where the power is and that's what we want. And so uh, you know, I would say this in regard to, you know, the Sanders campaign, which I left Peace and Freedom Party to, work, to support Bernie Sanders. And I've never regretted that decision. Bernie Sanders, you know, got 23 million votes. There's not more than any other socialist not only more than any other social presidential candidate in U.S. history, but more than all of them combined. And he was one man in, in 2016. Now we have that, he quadrupled himself. So then 2018, we have four Congress people, the squad, and a bunch of other people, lower level uh, people involved in the Bernie campaign. And now we're gonna have much more than that coming out of this election. 
So that's not just, oh, Bernie's saying this stuff and so on. He's not just another Democrat. We have to understand that they have another strategy. We need to understand that strategy. And personally, I support it. If we see that uh, uh, the Labor Party does work, I, I'll fully support it, as I did when the last Labor Party was started, I think in the 1990s. And before that, there was the, Un the Suits Committee for a United Left Ticket. Nobody even knows that. I don't know if you can even find it on Google. So uh, I think we need to take this seriously. I think uh, with the Bernie cam you know, campaign, he started not just uh, you know, using the word socialism, and I have the similar, you know, I consider myself a Leninist. And uh, I think lots of Leninists understand this situation and they choose to say, well, we need to work inside the Democratic Party because that's where the power is. And we, if we're going to take that power, we need to look at strategies and not keep on doing something that hasn't worked. Anyway, but I think that we need to take that seriously and not just dismiss this. But I know Gerald and I have had this discussion over and over again, haven't we, Gerald? Yes, we I'll have. Stop I'll stop there. Yeah, well, okay, I would like you. to. I would like to directly deal. Uh, in fact, I think that one of the undoings of the Peace and Freedom Party was their inability to intelligently deal with the question of Bernie Sanders' campaign. I don't think that helped them. That led to their decline. I want to tell you. I do not totally agree with Gene, but I did learn from him. So for instance, by listening to Gene and watching what was going on, we were, uh, we are still both members of the Oscar Grant Committee. We went, and uh, also Running Horse wanted us to do this. We went to all of the Bernie Sanders campaigns when he had a campaign in, the, in, the, in this area of Northern California, we packed up our little table, we packed up our leaflets, and we went and we found a very willing audience of people taking leaflets out of our hands. I remember uh, Sonoma County, 30,000. Sacramento, 15,000. Sac uh, San Francisco, Oakland, Wherever Bernie went, we went. Now, is Gene right or wrong on the question of revolutionaries, committed revolutionaries, doing political work inside of the Democratic Party? I would not have the arrogance to try to give an answer to that right now. The fact of the matter is, leads me back. It leads me back to the need for a revolutionary party. Only a revolutionary party with a class conscious committed staff would be able to conduct a discussion and have the political authority to have disciplined work inside the Democratic Party. Of, of course there's gonna be work in the Democratic Party. What are you nuts? Of course. But what is the difference between work and capitulation? Now, here's where Gene and I disagree. I believe that, that uh, Bernie Sanders should not have sustain, uh, suspended his campaign. I do not agree with that. I believe that he saved Sleepy Joe by suspending his campaign. And I, I don't think that was good. And in fact, a revolutionary organization if they had influence, would have tried to dissuade him from doing that because everything has been downhill for the left in the Democratic Party since he suspended his campaign. Down, down, down. That's my analysis. I know Gene and I won't agree on everything, but that's the point. There needs to be a central location where we discuss such matters and the majority rules and we carry it out and we learn from our mistakes and we tweak it and adjust it. But we do have to have that discussion and that organization unfortunately does not exist at this moment. I'm just one real quick 
real quick comment that we see that neoliberalism likes to contract out everything, even if it's working well. Can, well, can so you come? Yeah. Just say, well, let me just finish. Maybe we should con they should contract out our government to an organization that knows how to do it, and that would be Xi Jinping. <laughs> so I just want to say that. <laughs> okay, China's chairman is our chairman. Okay, <laughs> uh, Alan, uh, I would like you to go next because uh, Richard, Rich Fallenbaum, uh, I don't see his hand up, but after you would be Rich Fallenbaum if he wants to speak. Uh, his hand was up earlier, but it's not up. So, Alan, go ahead. Sure. I have a, a first of all, great presentation, Gerald. Great tying together the big, big picture and the local struggle. Really one of the best we've had. Um, two questions, one real quick. Uh, maybe Sharon knows about this too, but what, what is the racial composition of the charter schools? Is that, is that contributing to the segregation, the trend to segregation, or at least the whites, uh, um, uh, you know, how's that figuring in? My second question is, and this one's a hard one, actually, it's not exactly on the education issue, but you've been out there on the ground doing, you know, uh, on the ground organizing during the pandemic. And I think a lot of us feel very um, limited by the pandemic and how do you handle this in terms of getting around the, all the, um, the problems that, you know, we have to worry about in terms of transmitting or getting infected? Like, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts about this? I know you may not have the answer, but whatever you can say that might be some thinking about that, that would be helpful. So two questions. Okay. Your first question. Unfortunately, there are some differences, and I have to be careful with what's called averages. Let me give you an example, Alan. If we're looking at the average income in a bar, right? All of a sudden, Jeff Bezos walks into the bar, and the average income of that bar would be close to a billion dollars. Well, so we have to be careful. We have to look more precisely. So let's move on to the question of racial composition of the charters. There are some charters that are started by black people. So for instance, there's a charter in Oakland that we are now integrating back into the public schools. And I look at it as a model and I'm hoping this, this becomes something that we can repeat over and over until there are no more charter schools. It's called Roses Through Concrete. And they were, they were um, their charter was taken from them by Oakland Unified School District. Now, you say, well, what I thought you said that the Oakland Unified School District was for charters. Sometimes. Their grades wound up not being qualitatively better than some of the majority black schools. So they took their charter from them, okay? So here's a situation where now we're working to reintegrate roses to con through concrete back into Howard Elementary. And, and hopefully we will also create a junior high school out of that mix. So to answer your question, generally speaking, in general, it does not look good for, for black people with the charter schools. Um, the, the generally speaking, in general, the charter schools are whiter, much whiter than our public schools, to be honest with you. But we do have to look, I look like Sharon ready to, to jump in, but we do have to look at specifics. I hope, I hope I'm answering your question and I'm not trying to fiddle and, and fuck, I mean, um, you know, make, excuse me. I'm not trying to fiddle around. It, it is some complexity in answering that question. Now, on the pandemic and organizing, I am a hard-nosed, hard-headed organizer. I was trained and taught the essentials by my father who was in the Communist Party through a, a, a network of Black Communist Party people who used to uh, volunteer in the bookstore in New York. These are the people that gave me my A, B, and C of organizing. 
and instilled in me the need to be a socialist. So I am not the best I'm finding out uh, progenitor of what people should do. Because I, I said, never. I said, we must continue to organize. And so we, we go to the food giveaways every Monday and Thursday at Oakland Unified School District. There are 28 schools that give away food. And we are there with our table trying to, you know, introduce the parents to the candidates and our can and, and, and to the whole, all of the questions involved in the privatization of the schools and the resistance against it. We have had some success. We, we start off by giving out a coloring book that we created in the DSA. That's right, the DSA does some things quite well. To the children with crayons at our own expense. We get no money to do this. And then um, we then try to communicate with the parents. We need more Spanish speakers. Anybody that speaks Spanish, we need you now. We need help. But believe it or not, through their children, we're able to talk to the parents. So the pandemic has, Alan, I have to admit, through my experience, negatively impacted our ability to directly contact our working class people. The problem is also that people take moral positions not based on material reality. So I have had campaigns that actually said, I'm not gonna mention any names now, just to say, it, it's an insult to knock on the doors because it's a pandemic. I said, are you out of your fucking, I, I, would, I, I differed with this opinion and in fact rebelled against it. And what I found is the following, that in some neighborhoods, when you knock on the door and step back six feet, some people answer the door. Some of them come out with their masks on. We already have our masks, our, our goggles, and our gloves, and they talk with us. And that's how I recruited some block captains, by knocking on people's doors. Some people talk to us through the screen. I, I recommend that we not stop ourselves from organizing. One of the things I liked about the name of Sharon's organization was block by block. And that in, in, it said, talk to your neighbors, knock on the doors. You know who your neighbors are. You can talk to your neighbors. But generally speaking, Alan, the impact of the pandemic has been negative. And, and one of the reasons that it is, is because of the leadership that we have in both the Republican and the Democratic Party. Because they have not shown the working people a way out. And so when you don't see a way out, the one thing you're going to do is cling to life itself. And you can't blame people for that. I continue to knock on the doors. I continue to go to mass rallies and build mass rallies. I continue to be out there. And I'm gonna tell you something, I'm human. I've been sick, I get sick. And I, they propagandized so bad, I thought I had the damn thing. And then I went and took the test. No, I didn't have it. It was, they implanted that in my mind. So, I would say the following, that we please wear a mask, social distance, your gloves, your goggles, but never give up your connection to your class. Never. We can't change anything without the class. So to, to cease to try, no, I can't, I personally can't do that. We have about 20 members of the DSA to work with me, and we, we try to do this, but fear from the leadership that is provided to us, and there is a pandemic. We have only been partially successful. That's Thank why you. we need your help.
Yeah, thank you, Jer. I uh, will go. I know there are two teachers who want to speak, but Rich Fallenbaum has been waiting. So I want to go to Rich, followed by Mer, followed by Sharon. So, Rich. Okay. Um, yes, I've been, long, I've been waiting for a while. I think we have a little technical problem because I keep. Can you see uh, your, your voice is not coming through to me too loud? Can you get closer to your microphone? Uh, yes. Thank I, you. Uh, um, for some reason, my, my hand is being taken down uh, a couple of times. I don't know. We have a technical problem. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Actually, I'm here with Karen Stewart, and she wants to make a comment or a question. So go ahead, Karen. Yeah, so I, um, I just, can everybody hear me? I just wanted to follow up. Uh, first off, thank Gerald for his presentation, which I really appreciated uh, getting this sort of hands-on look at what's going on locally. Really, really appreciate that, and particularly your comments about uh, Kaiser Elementary School, which is what I wanted to follow up on. All five of my grandkids went to that school wow. and I was involved driving them back and forth for 10 years. And I did a lot of volunteering in the classroom, especially because one of my grandkids has a disability. And I mean, I could take up 10 minutes just talking about how a child with a disability is treated in that public school as opposed to any other place she could have gone, the level of care and sensitivity that she received. But all my grandkids have been willing to go to board meetings to fight for that school because they loved it so much. And part of what made the school so good was I think uh, uh, the, one of the reasons why they've attacked it and, and they've been trying to get rid of it for 10 years because ever since I started showing up there, they've been trying to get rid of that school. The, um, there's like a, a social cohesion in the school uh, which is led by the teachers, some of whom are older and have been teaching at that same school for a long time. The teachers know each other well, they work well together, they create an inc incredible climate of, uh, of joy and camaraderie among the, the students and the teachers. You know, when I would go to school, I'd walk down the hall and I would hug several people, students, teachers, other, other parents, other grandparents, lots of grandparents showing up at that school. And I can't tell you how brokenhearted I was when I went to several of the board meetings. And you could see the people on that board, there was nothing that anybody, any parent, any teacher, anybody was gonna be able to say to change their minds. They were obviously so tied in to some sort of corporate commitment that they had made previously. And uh, the, the teachers from that school and some of the parents were actually hospitalized because in, in an effort to, to uh, shut down the board meetings, some of them were knocked down by, by police or sec school security people. Anyway, it's you know the level of commitment of those teachers but also because they had been at the school for a long time, they were fairly high up on the pay, pay scale. So I'm assuming that that had something to do with them wanting to shut down Kaiser. Also the piece of property that the school sits on is kind of nestled in the hills between Oakland and Berkeley, worth a lot of money if they shut it down and and it's actually just up the hill from Bentley, a very exclusive private school. So I'm sure that real estate is part of the consideration. But I, I could go on all day telling you about how amazing all the kids get art every week, twice a week in the classroom. All the kids in the three upper grades are required to take instrumental music and they have an instrumental program for the younger grades as well. It's just an extraordinary school, it's a loving place. Oh, and one more point. 
it's racially integrated and the black and brown kids at that school usually when you find even when you find a decent integrated school the black and brown kids will tend to do worse than the white kids relative at kaiser it, that's still the case to some extent, but much less so than you normally see. The black and brown kids are lifted up in that school, and partly because of the political commitment of some of the teachers who have been teaching uh, the kids. They've been reading Howard Zinn from, you know, third and fourth grade. They put on plays that are political. Anyway, I, I will stop now and, and move out of the way. But thank you so much, Gerald, for bringing up Kaiser. So I have a suggestion, Gerald, hold off. Let the two teachers speak first, and then you come back. Is that okay? Because the time is limited. No problem, brother. No okay. problem. All right. So, uh, Merle uh, goes next, and then Sharon. Merle, please unmute yourself. And... I think I did. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So um, with my contact with the teachers I've worked with during this last pandemic um, session at school, teachers right now are looking for help to find prepared virtual learning. You know, they had to come up with all this virtual learning very, very quickly. And um, privatization proponents like Gates, Comp Brothers, Google have quickly come up with lessons on a variety of topics. And unless teachers have knowledge of privatization's evil, evils and ability, to, therefore, to evaluate the hidden agendas for these prepared lessons, it's pretty tricky. So I put, I put on the chat a website of my favorite teacher magazine of a group called Rethinking Schools that has had great articles in the past on, on what is this privatization um, movement and how does it work and how's, you know, what are the evils of it. And it, uh, I recommend it. And maybe Sharon, you've heard of that, Rethinking Schools? Yeah, so I put on the website there on the chat part if anybody wants to check that out. Thank you. Okay, Sharon, you're next, please. Uh... Um, thank you. Um, on the question of the uh, relative integration of charters, I, I agree with what Cheryl said. It, it's tricky to, to measure. There are some, there are a lot, relatively speaking, there are a lot of Latino kids who go to charters. Why is that? So people from Mexico and other Latin countries uh, are used to seeing rich children wearing uniforms going to private schools. So here they come to the United States, they come to Oakland, and they see little children wearing uniforms walking into certain schools and they, uh, they think that they're getting a private school education if they send their kid to a charter school. And that is talked up and they're sold a bill of goods about that. Now, of course, there are some charters that do just fine, or at least as well as public schools. So it's very, very complex. I'll leave it at that. I wanted to say something about the question of integration. This is a topic that's much broader than discussing charter schools and privatization. The schools in this country, in my opinion, are not responsible for the fact that our neighborhoods and our cities and, and our towns are still extremely segregated and even more so in the North in a lot of ways than the South. So it's a huge problem. As, as a veteran of the civil rights movement, I feel despair when I think about how, how little we've come in terms of integration of schools and how terribly segregated our schools are to this day. Um, there are a few integrated schools in Oakland, Kaiser having been one of them. My son went to Sequoia and Bret Hart. Both of them are integrated. I mean, I, there was no way I was sending my child to a segregated school. And um, he would have gone to an all black school rather than to, a, to an all white school for sure. Um, but there are fewer, that was, you know, 25 years ago. So it's much worse now in Oakland. There are fewer integrated schools than there were back then. Um, but it's a much bigger question. And I think we should think about it as a separate topic that we could come back to as Marxists to talk about what we're going to do about this. Because an, 
segregated working class is having a much harder time making a revolution, will have a much harder time making a revolution. And it just breaks my heart, but I understand it at the same time. It breaks my heart to hear educated, well-meaning black people say, well, maybe separate but equal is not so bad. I mean, when I heard that somebody say that at a meeting, I, Gerald was there, I just gasped. And yet this person is just coming from her own experience. Wanting, what does she want? She wants a good public school in her, her neighborhood for her children. And if that is going to be all black because the neighborhood is all black, well, then she still wants a good school a, a, with good teachers, experienced teacher, et cetera, a good curriculum, et cetera. So it's just really, really complex, and I think we should we should take it up as a separate issue. Okay, now, uh, Gerald, please go ahead. I want to tell, uh, we have about six minutes remaining in the program, officially. Uh, we are, we can be flexible a few minutes, but after that, we'll have a informal session, which can continue uh, for the next uh, half an hour until about one o'clock. Recording will stop in after six minutes, which is our practice. So, Gerald, please go ahead. And if you have some uh, wrapping, you know, comments to wrap up your program, you can do that now or wait for one more question. There are no hands up right now. So it's your, your turn. Okay. I don't want to take all of our, our, our time. I, I just, the, the, the Kaiser parent, what was your name again that was with Richard? Karen. No, the, the lady that was speaking. No, her name is Karen. The, the woman Karen is Stewart. Yeah. Okay, well, Karen, thank you for your comments because it, it simply verified all of my experience. But Karen, I want to say it is not over. Now, maybe I am particularly stubborn, but that's why I work so hard for a victory because sometimes reaction can not only be put on its heels, so it can be raised to the ground. And I believe if we get a majority on this school board, we can start turning situations around. I believe there's hope. Now, Meryl, on please don't say virtual learning because it ain't virtual, it's real. <laughs> Online learning is something that we're gonna have to conquer. You're so right though, when you point out how the bosses see it, and from their perspective, they want to lay off teachers. And so I warn all of the teachers I work with, y'all stop that sniveling and master this craft. Your teachers, we're going to have more of this online learning, not less. And in order to, to win, we have to at least be competent and we can't let them say that we don't know what we're doing because that gives them an excuse to get rid of some of our most militant teachers. Our most militant teachers have to be our most competent teachers. That's my, my personal view on that. Uh, Sharon, I, I don't know. You and me should be in the same goddamn party because we agree on everything. So I, I don't know what to say about it, but that party does not exist. We need, this is not a joke. This is not rhetoric. Every step in my life, I go so far. I don't care if it's the Oscar Grant Committee and we're organizing in um, Vallejo, where, by the way, a parent just got $20 million for the murder of, of a family member from, by the police. Vallejo is off the charts in terms of this police violence. $20 million, small victory. And I say small because, you know, the reality is the killing keeps right on growing. That, once again, what do we need? We need a workers' party. We need a party for the working class in so many ways. So I just want to stop there. I, I just thank you all for participating. I am humbled by your support. Thank you. Before we go uh, close the session, I just wanted to say, uh, the question of party, I just want to make a comment on that. 
it's uh, if you, since you're a rich student of Lenin and many people in this are, you know that Lenin in, started out with uh, Social Democratic Labor Party, Russian RSTLP, and then struggled and then that had two wings and then finally split. And then Trotsky left, he had his third formation and so forth. So I think the problem is this right now, it's not that we don't have parties. The problem is revolutionary theory has not been advanced. And Lenin said revolution is not possible. And I'm convinced this situation cannot be corrected without the overthrow of capitalism at this stage. In the United States, and many places, including the country I was born in, in India, even more so than here. So I think the revolutionary theory, now what I see is that Lenin said there are two conditions which are required to be fulfilled for a revolution to occur. And one of them, and aside from revolutionary theory, so revolutionary theory is very important, and that's different than the Maoist uh, position on it, even though uh, Mao himself had a theory with which he succeeded. A lot of Maoists believe uh, theory arises out of practice. If I'm not mistaken, that's their belief. But Lenin said, no, it is revolutionary theory. So Lenin laid down two conditions. First of all, the working class cannot live anymore uh, in, this, in the situation that has been created as they used to be able to. That's condition number one. And I think more than half the people in the United States now fall in that category. So they're almost majority, okay? Uh, if not majority, they're very close to it. Second condition is that the ruling cannot, class cannot rule like they used to be able to. Sure. And I see this is what's going on also. We are approaching uh, with Trump and, and they're taking turns they are ruling with more and more repression, more and more spying, more and more violation of their own bourgeois constitutions right. with Obama ordering killing of American uh, citizens overseas. And of course, uh, you know, both parties. So therefore the rule of law that they made, therefore they're not able to rule. So both conditions are approaching. What is missing in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, and you can comment on it, uh, Gerald, is the, is the revolutionary theory. I think revolutionary theory, what communist parties, we have several, are not uh, contributing to, they're using a revolutionary theory of Lenin of time ago, but Lenin, Lenin himself would have a new revolutionary theory for our time in this country. So with that, I want to, and I give you the last minute to comment on it, and then we end the program formally, and, and then informal discussion can go on for the next half an hour. Okay, I would just add to that. There is, I don't know if, if we actually have a difference of opinion here. I would just say that the relation, that there must be a dialectical relationship between theory and practice, that each informs the other. Now, I would, I would just say that, that's all. I don't, I, I, I we need a party, <laughs> we need a party. Can I add one thing? Okay. That we uh, have two Marxist-Leninist working class parties. They're known as the Communist Party USA and the, the uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation. Both of these are communist parties they're Leninist parties. They're working for the working class. And I think perhaps if you, I don't know why we need to start another rather than maybe we'll just start joining one of these. That's all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs>
to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or di- directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.